Hello, beautiful friends, and welcome back to my jungle. <laughs> I hope this video finds you super well and that you are just having the best week of all time. A lot of you are probably coming straight here from part one of the Summerton Man series, in which case you are already aware that my name is Liz and we are best friends forever. Just like in part one, I have timestamps in the description below. So if I start rambling at any point and you are like, Liz, for the love of God, please stop, then you can zip around to any way you would like in the video. If you haven't seen part one and you don't fancy spending the next 40 to 50 odd minutes sitting there just totally confused, then I would highly recommend clicking the link just up here. You can catch yourself up on all of the details we discussed in the last video, and I will sit here and wait patiently. It's fine, you can click it. As usual, it's not just us here today. We of course have Lily Girl here to keep us company, give us emotional support, and just a very generous dose of visual and audio disturbances throughout the video. Editing Liz, let's switch to Lily Cam. Lily, you look very ready today. <laughs> Are you ready for part two? Okay, so we left off with a little bit of a cliffhanger in part one. Police had just used a phone number written in the back cover of a copy of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam to track down a young nurse named Justin. And when they showed Justin the plaster cast of the Somerton man, she swore that she had never seen him in her life. But it was pretty damn obvious to everyone that she was lying and that she did, in fact, know him. When detectives pressed Justin on the Rubaiyat saying, you know, this is how we tracked you down your phone number was literally written into the back cover. She admitted that she had owned a copy, but that she had given it to a man she met during the war three years earlier. Now, Justin said that this man's name was Alf Boxel. And if you'll remember from part one, she could neither confirm or deny whether the plaster cast of the Somerton man was Alf. So police are pretty amped, right? They've spent about eight months by this point trying to figure out who on earth the Somerton Summerton man was. And now finally they had a solid lead. They believe the Summerton man may have just been this ALF character that Justin had given her copy of the Rubaiyat to. So they immediately began the process of tracking him down. And they managed to do so really quickly, within a couple of days in fact, to a house in Sydney in New South Wales. And just imagine detectives' disappointment when they knocked on the front door and who answered but Alf Boxall, alive and well, never even having heard of the case, let alone being aware of his connection to it. But they persisted, determined he must have some connection to the case. So they asked him for his copy of the Rubaiyat, probably expecting him to shrug and say, I don't know, it went missing about eight months ago. But instead, he promptly handed them his copy of the Rubaiyat. And it was the one that Justin had given to him three years earlier fully intact, complete with an inscription from her in the front cover and with the words Tamam should still in place exactly where they should be. Alf told detectives that he had met Justin in 1945. At this point, 39-year-old Alf had been an army lieutenant serving in the water transport section of the Royal Australian Engineers. While 24-year-old Justin had been working at the Royal North Shore Hospital completing her training to become a nurse. The two had struck up a friendship of sorts and Justin had given Alf his copy of the Rubaiyat over drinks at the Clifton Gardens Hotel in Sydney in August of 1945, just before he was about to be sent off for active service. And most sources say that this was a friendship, implying that it was purely platonic, but to me there seems to have been at least a little bit of a romantic element to it. I mean, they're having drinks, Justin is giving Alf a book of what she was later quoted to have called love poems. And in the inside cover of Alf's copy of the Rubaiyat, Justin had written out verse 70 from the book. And if you're curious, it reads, Indeed, indeed, repentance oft before. I swore, but was I sober when I swore? And then and then came spring, and rose in hand my threadbare penitence, a pieces at all. Below this, she had signed herself off as Justin, and this was also the name that Alf said that she had introduced herself to him as. In the years following, Alf had sent Justin a letter to which she had replied saying she was now married, and that was the last contact he had ever had with her. So unfortunately for police, they found themselves at yet another dead end. 
Around this time, police also sent a photo of the letters that were in the back cover of their copy of the Rubaiyat to a well-accomplished code cracker in the Navy. And this code cracker was essentially among the very, very best in the world at what he did. And he worked on the letters for weeks, but still could not determine their meaning. And this would just be the very start of many, many attempts over the years to figure out the meaning of these letters. And of the people that have worked on them, there really only seem to be two things that they can all agree on. Firstly, the letters do mean something, as in it's not just a bunch of gibberish, meaningless letters that someone decided to write down at random. And secondly, the frequency of the occurrence of letters or the pattern of the letters, if you will, compares more favorably to English than they do any other of the countless written and spoken languages that they've been compared to. But those two things are pretty much all that everyone can seem to agree on. Among the first and, in my opinion, cutest theory that has been formed is that the Somerton Man was an aspiring amateur poet. I mean, the letters were broken up into... F oh, is it lily break time? Hi. What a nice cuddle. Anyway, the letters were broken up into four lines. So let's say... The Somerton man was feeling a little bit insecure in his poem writing abilities, so instead of writing it out in full, he wrote down just the first letters of the words of the poem he was writing so that that way he knew only he would know what the letters meant. This form of abbreviation using just the initial letters of words is called initialism, and it also hinted at the letters maybe being a mnemonic device. If you haven't heard of a mnemonic device, it is a a very commonly used technique that people use to remember a specific phrase or maybe a list of items. For example, if I wanted to remember the colors of the rainbow, I might shorten them to Roy G. Biv, something that wouldn't mean a lot to anyone else, but that would help me remember the colors red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and Violet. This theory of the letters being a mnemonic device to jog the Somerton man's memory about something is definitely one of the most favoured and most likely theories, but the crowd favourite theory, of course, is that the letters made up a spy code of some kind, because that would be way more exciting than the letters just making up some abbreviated grocery shopping list that the Somerton man was trying to remember. But despite tons of people putting in tons of hours and just their blood, sweat and tears into trying to figure out the meaning of these letters over the last 70 years, their meaning to this very day is still a complete mystery. And so the code remained uncracked and there was pretty much zero progress made in the case for many years. There was a second coronial inquest held in March of 1958, but this inquest seemed to be more of a show and a formality than any actual genuine attempt to try and solve the mystery surrounding the Somerton Man. And it ended just as inconclusively as the first inquest had 10 years earlier. For reasons I'm not sure of, the few developments that there had been since the first inquest weren't mentioned at all during the second inquest. So there was no mentions of the Rubaiyat, of the code of Justin or Alf, none of that. It really was just all of the same information from the first inquest repeated over. They still didn't know whether the Somerton man had committed suicide or if he was murdered. And of course, they still had no idea who he was. The same month that the second inquest was held, a man did come forward to police saying that he had seen a well-dressed man carrying another well-dressed man over his shoulder down by the water's edge at Somerton Beach the night before the Somerton man's body had been discovered. But as it had been 10 years by this point and the man didn't really have any other information to give, the only thing police could really do with this statement is speculate that maybe the Somerton man had been one of these two men. A few months later in November 1959, a man named E.B. Collins said that he knew 
the identity of the Somerton man. E.B. Collins was a prisoner in Wanganui Prison in New Zealand at the time, but apparently nothing came of this either because there was exactly zero information I could find on anything else Collins had to say or how seriously police took his claim. Oh, another lily break. Okay. You, oh, you want to do Paul? Paul? Oh, you're so clever. You're such a clever girl. For the next 45 odd years, aside from a special that was aired on the ABC in 1978 called The Summerton Beach Mystery, the case just sat dormant, just gathering dust. It had well and truly fizzled out. A lot of the items related to the case, like the Summerton man's clothes, his suitcase, the rubaiyat, they were all either lost or disposed of over the 70s and 80s. Even the original autopsy report went missing. And then one day in the mid-2000s, a man was just innocently sitting in a laundromat waiting for his clothes to finish drying. This man's name was Derek Abbott. And while Derek was waiting for his clothes to dry, he made what he had no idea was a life-changing decision to pick up a magazine and read an article about the top 10 unsolved mysteries in Australia. The Somerton Man case came in at number two and Derek thought the case was intriguing to be sure, but being a professor in electrical engineering, he was most drawn to the code from the Rubaiyat and he thought it might be a fun assignment for his students at the University of Adelaide to try and crack it. Flash forward a few years to 2009 and Derek and his team, while they hadn't actually managed to crack the code, had made more progress than anyone ever had. And while it was initially just the code that Derek had been drawn to, the more he found out about the Summerton Man case, the more he was hooked in. Most people that had been actively involved in researching and investigating the case had long given up by this point. But Derek was relentless and he eventually went on to become one of the world worldwide leading experts in the case. He thought his investigation had reached a dead end when he looked into the phone numbers that were written into the Rubaiyat because, as you may remember, Justin had requested that her name be scrubbed from the Summerton man's file. But like I said, Derek was relentless. He managed to source old phone books from the 40s and after a good deal of searching, he found a sister J.E. Thompson attached to the phone number that had led police to Justin all those years ago in 1949. Now, sister could have meant that this J.E. Thompson was a nun, which would mean it was a dead end, or it could have meant she was a nurse like Justin. Liking those odds, Derek traveled to this woman's hometown, Sydney, to determine if she and Justin were one and the same. But he found out pretty quickly that J.E. Thompson had unfortunately passed away a couple of years earlier in 2007. Despite this, he managed to find and speak with people that had known her, even managing to dig up an old photo of her. A photo that he took directly to Paul Lawson, the man police had commissioned to make the plaster cast of the Summerton Man. Without saying anything, Derek placed the photo on the desk in front of Lawson, and Lawson turned around and said, oh, that's Mrs. Thompson. And he went on to confirm that Derek was right. J.E. Thompson was the woman known as Justin that had nearly fainted in his office all those years ago when police had shown her the plaster cast of the Somerton Man. So now he knew who Justin was, Derek was able to find out a bit more about her. Justin had been born Jesse Harkness in Sydney in 1921, but by 1949, her name had changed to Jessica Ellen Thompson, hence the J.E. Thompson. But she also went by Joe. Jess or Justin. Those that knew her said that she had a little bit of a wild streak to her and could be a little bit odd at times. It was said that she had a bohemian vibe to her. In fact, one of her friends said that if she had been born a few decades later, he could easily picture her being a hippie in the 60s. But despite this free spiritedness and wild streak, Justin also appreciated the finer things in life, like nice houses, 
and fancy cutlery. She started her nurse training in Sydney in 1942 during the war, and a few years later, once the war had ended, she then moved to Melbourne and got married to a man named Prosper Thompson. At least that's what she told all of her friends and family and the neighbours and the police. It was only Justin's mother that knew that Prosper was actually already married and in the process of getting a divorce from his first wife. Justin and Prosper wouldn't officially get married until 1950. In 1947, the year before the Somerton man died, Justin moved again, this time to Adelaide, and changed her surname to Thompson, even though her and Prosper weren't actually married yet. Justin changing her name early like this and telling all of her friends and family that her and Prosper were already married was most likely part of an elaborate scheme to conceal the fact that Justin was pregnant out of wedlock, something that obviously we wouldn't even blink at in today's age, but then it was very scandalous and she would have been ostracized and shamed should anyone find out. And here is the kicker, the baby wasn't Prosper's. And we know this because Justin would tell a friend in later years how grateful she was that Prosper had married her and raised the baby as though it were his own child. So Justin had a healthy baby boy in July of 1947 and named him Robin McMahon Thompson. And now it makes a little bit more sense why a couple of years later when police came knocking at her door with a book of love poems with her phone number written in it, why she was so evasive. Justin was probably terrified that getting involved in the case would somehow result in it being discovered that she was an unwed mother. Our friend Derek, having uncovered all of this information and slowly putting the pieces together, started to form a little suspicion or a theory about Robin, Justin's son, a theory that some of you might be forming right now as well. If this were a movie, there would probably be a montage of flashbacks right now and you'd be sitting there like, how the hell did I miss that? I mean, Robin would have been about a year and a half old in 1948 when the Somerton man came to Adelaide. There was the unknown man asking after Justin to her neighbors. Justin's number being in the Somerton man's copy of the Rubaiyat, her reluctance to identify the Somerton man or be involved in any way in the case. Right now, the question on everyone's mind should be, was Robin the Somerton man's son? That was definitely the question on Derek's mind, so he immediately started looking into Robin. And he didn't have to look very far because Robin had been a professional ballet dancer. Remember the Somerton man's ballet dancer calves and his wedge-shaped toes? <sighs> Turns out one day out of the blue, when Robin was a young boy, Justin had out of the blue and without explanation taken him to a ballet class. And this was before Billy Elliot, when it was still very unusual for boys to be interested or encouraged into ballet. So why had Justin just randomly taken her son to a ballet class? One might speculate that it was because Robin's father had enjoyed ballet dancing and she thought his son might as well. And Robin did love ballet. He immediately took to it, just having a natural talent for it, even dancing professionally in the Australian ballet for several years. So there were lots of old photos of him for Derek to find. And looking at the photos, Derek saw that there was a resemblance between Robin and the Somerton man, but he very soon realized it went way beyond this resemblance. Earlier that year, he had been able to go in person and see the plaster cast of the Somerton man, and he had noticed something odd about the Somerton man's ears. His simba, which is the upper hollow of the ear, was a lot larger than his cavum, the lower hollow, when it's usually the other way round. This trait only occurs in approximately 1-2% to of the Caucasian population, and it's a feature that's generally genetically inherited. So when he saw a photo of Robin that clearly showed his ears, he was astounded to find that Robin shared this same genetic trait. And on top of this, he was able to get a hold of the Somerton man's dental records and had a couple of dental experts examine them. Tangent alert, um, 
Here's a fun fact I learned when I was today years old. Remember in part one when I spoke about the Somerton man missing a large portion of his back teeth? This had always seemed at odds to me with the obvious pride he took in his appearance. So it turns out in the 40s, a common and almost fashionable thing to do would be to intentionally loosen your teeth. The idea was you were going to lose them as you got older anyway, so why not speed up the process and get yourself a brand spanking new set of shiny, beautiful dentures? Oh, anything to do with teeth just freaks me out. So that's my fun fact done. Um, Back to the story. These dental experts informed Derek that as well as missing these back teeth, the Somerton man was also missing his lateral incisors and had likely been missing them since birth due to a rare genetic disorder called hyperdontia. Hyperdontia is a genetically inherited disorder that when looking at photos of his smile, Derek realized that Robin also shared with the Somerton man. Now, the chance of Robin and the Somerton man sharing these two genetic traits and it just being some random coincidence is estimated to be about one in, you know, just a casual 10 to 20 million. So 99.999% sure that he had found the son of the Somerton man and that he was on the verge of solving this 60-year-old mystery Derek happily set off to find Robin. But literally just a couple of months before this, in March of 2009, Robin had sadly passed away. So disappointed but still undeterred, Derek moved on down the line, asking himself, well, did Robin have any children? And he discovered that he did. Robin had a daughter with another ballet dancer, Roma Egan, in New Zealand, but this pregnancy had been unplanned and Robin and Roma felt that they didn't have the means to raise this child, so they had made the difficult decision to place her up for adoption. The girl's name was Rachel, and despite Rachel not knowing that she had been adopted or knowing anything about her birth parents, she had grown up with an intense interest in ballet, and she had always felt a disconnection from her family because none of them shared this passion with her and she had no idea where it came from. Then when she was in university, she was informed by a letter from a social worker that she had been adopted. So in her early 20s, she reconnected with her birth mother, Roma, and discovered that both Roma and her father, Robin, had been professional ballet dancers and it all finally made sense to her. Rachel eventually ended up moving to Australia to be closer to Roma And then one day out of the blue, she received a letter from our good friend, Derek Abbott, who just being the unstoppable Sherlock Holmes, we all know him to be by now, had managed to track her down. In the letter, Derek told Rachel all about the Somerton Man case and the 10 odd years he had spent researching it and how that research had led him first to Justin, then to Robin, and now to her. And he, of course, shared his theory that she was the Somerton man's granddaughter. Rachel's initial reaction to this letter was, I mean, probably similar to what a lot of our reactions would be. It all sounded crazy insane, like this Derek guy had either way too much time on his hands or he was in need of some serious psychiatric help. But after taking time to process everything, Rachel probably felt an intense curiosity sneak in. How could you not? This was a great opportunity for her to potentially find out more about her biological family's roots. So she decided to indulge Derek and agreed to meet with him. So Derek took Rachel out to a very fancy French restaurant in Brisbane to discuss with her his theory that she was the granddaughter of the Somerton man. And then he promptly asked to see her ears and her teeth. And he also just wanted just a little smidge of her DNA. Basically, Derek had serious game. 
Luckily for Derek by now, Rachel had herself developed a passionate interest in the case, happily agreeing to all his strange little requests. Um, Later in an interview, she would refer to herself as a willing victim. And as it turns out, Derek actually did have some serious game because after discussing the case over dinner, the two spent the entire evening together. And then by sunset the next day, They had decided to get married. Crazy, right? If you're feeling a little bit skeptical of this coupling, you are definitely not alone. This marriage has ruffled a lot of feathers and definitely drawn its fair share of criticism. There have been people that have said it was simply an attempt by Derek to write himself into the mystery of the case he was so obsessed with. And more than one person has accused him of marrying Rachel just for her DNA. Actually, Rachel's mother, Roma, was one of the most vocal that felt this way and she ended up giving Rachel an ultimatum which resulted in the two of them having a huge falling out and cutting off contact with each other. Personally though I think it's incredibly romantic. I mean the case that had quite literally taken over Derek's life led him to the love of his life. I mean it's classic swoon worthy romance material. Right Lily? Swoon with me, Lily. It's just so romantic. And fast forward to just over a decade later, and Derek and Rachel are still very much in love, still happily married with three children who are quite possibly the Somerton man's great grandchildren. Hanging on the wall in the children's playroom is a portrait of Justin and an artist's impression of what the Somerton man would have looked like when he was alive. Last year in 2020, Derek teamed up with an American genealogist and a virtual reality specialist to create this amazing, more realistic image of what the Somerton man looked like when he was alive. And they did this for a couple of different reasons. Firstly, the images that have been circulated of the Somerton man all these years were taken post autopsy. And I don't want to be too gruesome here. And if you don't know what takes place during an autopsy and you'd prefer to keep it that way, maybe just cover your ears for a minute. But before these photos had been taken, the man's skin had quite literally been peeled away from his face so that they could drill into his skull. His eyes had been removed for examination. Basically, the guy had been through a lot and probably wasn't looking a whole lot like his usual self. And the plaster cast that had been made of his head and torso hadn't been made until his body had been laying in the mortuary, slowly decomposing for six odd months. Another process that would have taken a serious effect on his appearance. So they made the image because both the photos and the plaster cast are not reliable ways for us to know what the Somerton man looked like when he was alive. Now, while Derek insists that he absolutely did not just marry Rachel for her DNA, and I do believe him, the two genuinely do seem very in love, but I mean... Of course, Derek has tested Rachel's DNA and he's found that Rachel has a lot of fourth cousins in the US. So if we accept this theory that she is the Somerton man's granddaughter, this is yet another little indication that the Somerton man hailed from the US. Back in 2009, when he inspected the plaster cast of the Somerton man, Derek, along with his team from the University of Adelaide, discovered that there were actually hairs embedded in the plaster. But unfortunately, these hairs only contain about 2% of the DNA needed to begin to form an identification. So Derek has been petitioning for over a decade now to have the Somerton man's body exhumed so that they can hopefully extract the DNA needed to identify him and potentially even determine how he died. But while the body was buried in a dry plot of ground, specifically chosen in case an exhumation was required in later years, the cost of the exhumation was going to be in the tens of thousands of dollars and would need to be raised privately. And even after this, there was going to be a lot of red tape to cut through. Derek's petitions were denied multiple times because Australia 
doesn't really like exhuming bodies unless it's like 130% necessary. There were also a lot of very vocal naysayers who said there was no point in exhuming the body because any DNA to be obtained would have been destroyed by formaldehyde used during the embalming process but this isn't quite accurate. Formaldehyde for sure would have destroyed a large amount of DNA, but according to Derek and as evidenced by the hairs found in the plaster cast, whoever did the embalming did a pretty patchy job. And there's still a very good chance that DNA could be sourced from the bones depending on the condition they're in. And now we finally get to the very exciting current day updates. The funds for the exhumation were were raised and permission was finally granted by the South Australian Attorney General Vicky Chapman, who also has a keen interest in the Somerton Man, having studied the case back in law school. And so in the early hours of Wednesday the 19th of May this year, the process of exhuming the remains of the Somerton man's body began. The remains were reportedly deeper underground than originally thought and the hard clay was difficult to dig through. But apart from those couple of hiccups, the process was completed with only a couple of hours delay. The remains were then transported to the Forensic Science Centre of South Australia where the process began to hopefully extract enough DNA of a high enough quality to test and finally, once and for all, confirm the identity of the Somerton man. Now, I know you guys are probably all hoping for a super dramatic ending to this video where I'm like, guess what guys, they found out who he is. But I can't do that because it turns out this process of extracting and testing the DNA could take months, if not years. Sorry. So instead, now that we're all pretty much experts on the Somerton Man case, don't come for me, Derek Abbott, we're going to do my favorite thing and sit back and speculate on all of the crazy theories about the case while we still can, you know, while it's still a mystery. Because at this rate, it's going to be solved in the next couple of years. And hopefully, if you're sitting there watching this in 2023, you're totally aware of who the Somerton Man was and you're just like, it was all so obvious. I can't believe these guys didn't work it out. But if you will kindly excuse us, we're going to go back to speculating while we still can. And I think the best place to start would be the few things we know for sure about the Somerton Man. To begin with, we know that he was well-dressed, could afford to travel, and seemed to take a great deal of pride in his appearance. So from this, we can assume that he was fortunate enough to not be poverty stricken or lacking for money, even though the only money found to belong to him at the time of his death was a measly six pence in his suitcase. This means that he was either some beautiful mind style genius that had somehow calculated the exact money he would need for a train ticket he bought but didn't use, a bus ticket he bought that he probably did use, and a pasty that he ate later. But it's probably more likely that he did have some cash or at least the change from these items in the wallet that he was missing. So does the missing wallet mean that he was robbed? Maybe. He was, after all, also missing the hat that you would have expected him to be wearing with such a nice suit. And it's unlikely that the hat just blew off his head at the beach because if it was that windy, surely the half-smoked cigarette on his collar would have been blown away as well. So maybe some less than favorable individual stole both his hat and his wallet while he was laying on the beach. But this does seem like a very bold move. It was a very public spot. And how could the person know that he was dead and not drunk? Were they not worried about waking him up by rifling through his pockets? Personally, I feel like a more satisfactory explanation might be that the Somerton man lost or forgot his hat at some point before he got to the beach and that he or someone else intentionally got rid of his wallet to hamper the efforts by investigators to discover his identity. 
Okay, so the next thing we know for certain about the Somerton man is that he died just a five minute walk from where Justin lived. And it's this detail that makes me 110% convinced that she did know him and that she knew at least some of the details surrounding how he died that night. It's just impossible for me to imagine that the Somerton man was that close to the house of a woman whose number was written in a book of love poems that she had likely given him and that he didn't visit her. I just cannot make that leap. I won't. My soft romantic heart won't let me. Another thing we know for certain about the Somerton man is that he was never reported missing and his body was never claimed. This, along with the fact that he wasn't wearing a wedding ring, could mean that he wasn't married or it could mean that he and his wife weren't local to the area, his wife was overseas and had no idea that he had been found dead. Or a sad thought would be that he had lost his entire family during the war. He could have been an orphan or he could have been a very good spy with no ties to anyone that would want to come forward and claim his body. Speaking of him being a spy, the next thing we know for certain is that the tags were removed from his clothes. But what we don't know is the significance or the meaning behind this, because although this is the key detail that tends to lead people down the spy theory trail, there could be a totally different explanation altogether. For instance, America American clothes, like the jacket in his suitcase, were very popular and in high demand after the war, and there were tons of shops and stalls that would sell them secondhand. And just like a lot of secondhand shops still do today, these shops and stalls would cut the tags out of the clothing. Maybe the Somerton man bought these clothes when he arrived in Adelaide and he wore them that day to impress Justin when he visited her. Because there is no question that he visited her, okay? Don't ruin this for me. But if we do assume that the tags were removed to make him more difficult to identify, this still doesn't mean that he was a spy. There seems to be this general consensus that the Somerton man was this super top guy, but what if that wasn't the case? Maybe he was into some dodgy criminal stuff, like trading on the black market, for instance, and he didn't want his clothes to be used to trace who he was in the instance that he was found dead. Or maybe the tags weren't even removed by him. Maybe they were removed by his killer if he was in fact murdered. The thing that most strongly points away from the spy theory to me is that his body was found in such an open and public area. You would think if he was a spy and he committed suicide or was murdered, it would have happened somewhere secluded and private and his body would have never been found. Like no one should have even known that he existed. Now, at the time that the Somerton man was in Adelaide, there was a top secret rocket testing area being bought in Wamora, which is about a five hour drive north of Adelaide, which I guess would be plenty of reason for a spy to be in the area. But I still think the reason of the spy theory being so prevalent is the timing of the Somerton man's death, the peak of the Cold War, plus the fact that he was arguably a foreigner, plus the fact that who doesn't love a good spy story? But moving on, let's talk about the things that we don't know about the Somerton man, like who the heck he was. I mean, we can pretty safely assume that he wasn't local to Adelaide or most likely even Australia. He had quite a lot of American items. And yes, the clothing and the aluminium comb could have been bought at one of these shops or stalls that I've mentioned, but the American thread that was found in his suitcase that was used to mend the pocket in his trousers, this thread that I remind you wasn't available for purchase in Australia, and the fact that his hair was styled in a way that was distinctly American is enough to convince me that he either spent a great period of time in America or that he was American. And because Jessen quite clearly knew him, but there was no mention of her ever having traveled to America, 
I'm going to venture a guess that this wasn't his first visit to Australia. The other big thing we don't know about the Somerton Man is obviously how he died. Although the most widely spoken about and accepted theory is that he was poisoned, it is still just that a theory. And to make this theory work, you have to ignore quite a few good details, like the fact that the usual indications of poisoning, like vomiting and convulsions, weren't present, that there was no receptacle for the poison itself found anywhere in the immediate area of the body, and the fact that the Somerton man felt well enough to light and smoke part of a cigarette not long at all before he died. One thing worth knowing about the pathologists of the time was that if they could not determine the cause of death, much like the earlier Victorian era, their go-to was to say that the person had been poisoned. Kind of like in House when they would always go straight to lupus, but if you ever watched House, you knew it wasn't lupus. I'm pretty sure they made t-shirts. The Somerton man's enlarged spleen actually more strongly suggests that he had an underlying health condition rather than him being intentionally poisoned. But then why did his heart randomly stop beating? If it was poison, it was determined that it wasn't administered through the pasty he had eaten. So it's instead been suggested that maybe it was administered through his cigarettes, mostly because they were a different brand to the box they were in. But at the time, it was quite a common thing for people to swap and share cigarettes. Usually people would put a less expensive brand into a more expensive box. And with the Somerton Man, it was the other way around. So there is that. But the price difference between the two brands was quite minimal. And it's a likely possibility that the Somerton Man bought them off a fellow passenger on the train to Adelaide. If the cigarettes were poisoned, maybe the poison had been meant for that person. It was just a very unreliable way for someone to poison someone in the 1940s. Still, the Taman Shud piece of paper hints at the Somerton man's death being intentional, suggesting either suicide or murder. But the Tamam Shud paper was very small, very tightly scrolled, and placed into a pocket that was extremely hard to access or find, evidenced by the fact that it wasn't found until several months after the Somerton man had died. If it was significant, why place it in such a hard-to-find spot? Another thing we don't know is the meaning of the letters in the cover of the Rubaiyat. They could have been an abbreviated shopping list. They could have been an attempt at poetry. They could have been some secret spy code. Despite years and years of effort put into deciphering the meaning behind these letters, we are seriously none the wiser. There's even been talk of micro letters within the letters, and this is a very interesting rabbit hole to go down, but the issue with this theory is that all we have to go off is a old non-HD image of the letters because, like I said, the Rubaiyat was lost years ago. And on top of this, there's disagreement on what some of the letters are. Some people say this is obviously a W, and others argue that it's an N. And we also don't know if this crossed out line holds any meaning either. Honestly, I'm pretty skeptical that we will ever know what these letters mean, but I do lean towards the theory that they were a mnemonic device to jog the Somerton man's memory about something. And what about the Rubaiyat itself? We don't know the significance of these letters being written into this specific book. We know that Justin gave the book to at least two different men, the Somerton man and Alf Boxall. Maybe this was her thing, giving her favorite book of love poems to men she was romantically involved with. There is another case worth mentioning here. A man named George Marshall died in 1945, the same year that Justin and Alf met, a short walk from the Clifton Gardens Hotel in Sydney, the place where Justin gave Alf his copy of the Rubaiyat. George Marshall was found laying on a rock ledge overlooking the beach, dead from apparent poisoning, and around his body was a newspaper, a glass tumbler, and a lemonade bottle containing liquid and some kind of powder. 
and laying open on his chest was a copy of the Rubaiyat. Now it's said that Alf's copy of the Rubaiyat was a dual language edition, the first language being English and the second language being Malay, which was the language spoken where Marshall was born in Singapore. So there are some pretty big coincidences happening here. People started suggesting that maybe the Rubaiyat itself was some kind of spy code. And to add fuel to the fire, Marshall's brother, who was a politician, went on to become Singapore's first chief minister not long after he died. But despite all of the rumors, Marshall's death was eventually ruled a suicide. Still on the subject of the Rubaiyat, we don't know how or why the Somerton man's copy ended up in the footwell of that car. The general assumption is that the Somerton man himself chucked it in there when he was walking past. But if this was the case, why? If he was looking to dispose of it, why not just place it in one of the bins that would have been dotted along the footpath he was walking on? Not in this car where sooner or later it was going to be found. Maybe he knew he was being followed and he was determined that his pursuer was not going to get their hands on that book, so he chucked it into the car through the open window. Or maybe if he was a spy, perhaps him putting this specific book into this specific car was some kind of pre agreement upon signal. And if that was the case, does that mean that the letters in the book were in fact some kind of spy code? Maybe he put the book in the wrong car and the operation went terribly wrong and that's how he ended up dead. Maybe it wasn't the Somerton man at all that put the book in the car. Maybe it was his killer. Maybe it was Justin. Maybe that's a lot of maybes. But really one of the most logical explanations is that the book was found on the footpath outside of the car, either having been dropped or potentially having fallen out of someone's pocket because it was in fact pocket size, more like a pamphlet than a book, if anything. And some well-meaning passerby assumed it must have belonged to the person who owned the car. So they popped it back in there to make sure it got back to its owner. But no matter how the Rubaiyat ended up in that car, I think something most of us can agree on is that it was meant to be found. The question is why? Now let's talk about a question that we haven't really explored yet, but it's one that's frequently discussed online, and that is, was Justin a spy? After Robin was born, Justin had a daughter with her husband, Prosper Thompson, and they named her Kate. And in 2014, Kate had an interview with 60 Minutes Australia about Justin, and she had some very interesting things to say about her mother. In the interview, Kate said that as a child, she quite often heard her mother speak in rushed, whispered Russian to some unknown person on the phone. And when Kate asked her about it, Justin refused to tell her how or why she knew Russian in the first place. Kate went on to say that Justin had taught English to newly immigrated Russians and that she also had a very keen interest in communism. And when it came to the Somerton man, Kate claimed that her mother had told her that she knew the identity of the Somerton man, but had lied, telling Kate that his identity was known to a higher level than police. And finally, she said that she had always had the fear that Justin, her mother, had been responsible for the Somerton man's death. So a lot of what Kate said during this interview has been called into question in the years since, so make of it what you will. But something worth noting when it comes to the Justin being a spy theory is that Alf Boxall had worked in intelligence before he and Justin met. When asked in an interview in the 70s if Justin could have possibly known that he had worked in intelligence, Alf's very vague response was only if someone told her. So just some food for thought. But Justin has always seemed to me like she has more to her than meets the eye. <sighs> Is that enough speculating? Are we done with speculating? Because I think we're done with speculating. 
So let's move on to one final speculation in final thoughts. So here is what I think happened, or at least the theory that I'm most fond of. I think the Somerton man and Justin were in love, that they met at some point during the war, had an affair of sorts, and conceived Robin. When she found out she was pregnant, I think Justin wrote the Somerton man a letter saying, hey, I'm pregnant. So the Somerton man got this letter and he decided to come to Adelaide to see Justin and to meet Robin and he spent the day at their house. That's why his shoes didn't show much wear. But I think the Somerton man had some kind of illness that he had been diagnosed with that caused his enlarged spleen and that he may have been told that this illness was fatal. Now the phone number of the local bank being in the Rubaiyat next to Justin's phone number I believe was significant. Maybe knowing he was going to die, the Somerton man wanted to set up Justin and Robin financially, and he had deposited all of his money into an account in Justin's name. But I think the real big purpose of this reunion, other than the Somerton man meeting his son, was that Justin was going to assist the Somerton man in committing suicide to avoid a long, painful death from this illness that he had. Okay, so hear me out. Justin was a trained nurse. I mean, she missed her final exams because she was pregnant with Robin, but she knew all of the coursework and the theory, and she had plenty of experience working in the hospital in Sydney. She also had a keen interest and a strong knowledge in pharmacology, so she likely knew what drugs to give the Somerton man that would kill him, but not be found in his system and traced back to her. For instance, strophanthin or digitalis. She was also said to be very forward thinking for the 40s and pro-euthanasia, but this was still a very difficult decision because they were in love. So the Tamim Should piece of paper was meant as a sentimental token of their doomed romance and its tragic end. So Justin gave the Somerton man the poison and he left the house and decided to walk to the beach, figuring it would be a as nice as place as any to die and he took the poison while he was walking it kicked in quicker than he expected so he may have vomited along the way by the time he reached the beach the poison was really setting in and he knew it so he didn't make it far from the steps he lied down on the beach and lit up one final cigarette as he took in the view and then he died the end that's what I think happened. Haters, feel free to poke holes in my story because I'm sure you probably could, but you can't deny it's romantic. One final note I would like to add about Derek and Rachel is that they are very clearly under no illusion that finding out the Somerton man's identity guarantees them a fairy tale ending. They might find out his identity and discover that Rachel isn't his granddaughter or that she is, but he was not a nice person who did not nice things. But Derek and Rachel say that no matter what they discover or don't discover, they will always owe him for bringing them together, that it wouldn't be possible for their children or their love that they have for each other to exist without him. I bet you didn't know how much romance was in this story when you started. And that, best friends, brings us to the end of our deep dive into the Somerton Man case. I am so sorry that you're probably left with way more questions than answers, but I still hope you enjoyed the series. I would love to hear all of your thoughts and theories in the comments below. Tell me who you think the Somerton Man was and how you think he died. Also, any details or connections that I missed because Trust me, I am well aware there are things that I missed. It kills me, but it was just impossible to fit everything in. Lily, would you like to come say bye? They're that way. Can you sing? <laughs> Thank you so much for hanging out with me and Lily. As usual, we appreciate it so much and we hope you have a magical week and we can't wait to see you in the next video. Bye.
up to stay afloat. It's nice, eh? Be a person.